will be presented by John Hayden, Magic, Madness, Heaven, Sin, Taylor Swift, Ancient Poetry, and the Allure of Amor. Uh, after 16 years as head of classical studies in English at three South Island secondary schools and being awarded a Wolf Fisher Fellowship in 2015 for striving to make classics relevant for the 21st century learner, John has now turned his attention towards customer service and writing, but nonetheless maintains an unhealthy obsession and with illusion, intertextuality, and classical reception. A music reviewer for the Otago Daily Times since November 2003, John has previously presented academic papers on classical illusion and pop music and the integration of hip-hop culture in, the Pacific po in Pacifica poetry. He has been published in the Journal of Classics Teaching and has recently contributed a chapter on the New Zealand education system to the soon-to-be-published volume Classics Teaching in Schools Worldwide. His journey to Swiftyhood began with the injustice of Blank Space losing the Grammy for Record of the Year in 2016. This quest has, been, has seen him aided and abetted by his daughter, of 11, who discovered his RSD-exclusive Crystal Clear Pink Vinyl of 1989, and subsequently published her own review of the Eras Tour movie, where she declared, Trouble, a banger, and wondered, who even is Kanye West? So with that... On all of our minds, I do present John Hayden. <clears throat> Kia ora, everybody. Welcome um, to the future down here in Otapoti, New Zealand, on a Tuesday morning, wintry Tuesday morning, high of four degrees. I'm just going to set my screen up so we can get on with this one. So, Magic, Madness, Heaven, Sin, Taylor Swift, Ancient Poetry, and the Allure of Amor is what I'm here to talk about today. Um, I have a feeling I might go slightly over time, so feel free to message with any questions at the conclusion of this, or maybe try and catch me at the uh, happy hour. We'll just see how we get on. Um, first of all, um, tēnā koutou katoa, kou kāgu te moanga, te awa waitaki. Uh, Ko Hayden toko inga wafano, ko hone inga wa, ko Maya toko tabahini, no otapoti ahau, tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. Um, thank you very much for that introduction there, Julie. Um, as I've said, as was said, I hosted the Disc Odyssey, um, all about pop music in classical. Um, in the classical realm, and I've also written about music um, for a fair wee while, so this is just a big conglomeration of, I guess, my passions um, outside of my day job. Um, my expertise is really in hip-hop and rap, so pop music is a bit uh, new for me, so I'm going to try my darndest here. What this will not be um, is a, hey, let's spot all the references in Taylor Swift's music because we will be here for ages. Um, this is just a, I guess, introduction to how she can be linked to the likes of Sappho and Catullus. And a lot of this is student-led as well. Um, a lot of the discussion, particularly in this first part, has just come up apropos of what we talked about in classes. Um, so here she is, Taylor Allison Swift. We all know who she is. Um, she is her own economy. She's her own country. So she doesn't need really any more introduction than that. So we're going to deep dive into some of her career and some of her lyrics to see how she does link. Um, one thing that gets missed is actually her um, interactions with the classics. Um, obviously, she references Shakespeare. She references Fitzgerald quite a lot. But she also has a little bit of a classical background. Um, she studied Latin at high school, and that's some of her books there that are uh, sitting behind Travis there. Um, and then a lot of the memes here are sort of showcasing the fact that she is classically classically trained. Um, can you tell the difference between Taylor Swift and Ovid? If you all behave, I might share that link to the BuzzFeed quiz with you all. Um, and then here's a really embarrassing thing. Is Taylor Swift influenced by Catullus? Um, that was just an offhand comment, and then it got turned into a 
advertisement. Um, so thanks very much to Cara or whoever sorted that out. Um, like I've said, <clears throat> this here, it's going to look like we're just handpicking lyrics and talking about how they link, but that's not the case. This is actual discussion. This has come from actual students um, who have tried to wind me up about Taylor Swift throughout the years and how she potentially links to classical stuff. So the first one off the bat is 2012, her album Red. She has a song called State of Grace. She references fate. She references the Achilles heel. Um, this idea of fate as well is um, coming to the fore a lot in her, uh, her newer stuff, um, thinking about folklore and evermore. Um, released during the pandemic. Um, there's the song Invisible String, where she talks about, you know, you're being tied to me, um, being her lover and all of this. And then there's a wee picture there of her and her video for Cardigan, the song of um, Folklore. And there's a golden string. So this idea of fate is something which is quite um, obvious in a lot of her lyrics. Um, another thing that she's co-opted is snake imagery, particularly in her reputation era. So Reputation came out in 2017. Um, it was a bit of a dumpster fire of an album, but it did have some key Taylor moments in it. This is one of them. Look What You Made Me Do, where she just goes scorched earth on all of her critics, um, and she employs a lot of the serpent imagery. So again, there's a, a deep classical sort of um, connection there with that imagery. Uh, in Folklore 2020, we have a lot of stuff, again, about fate. Um, not the fates as previously seen, but here we have in the middle of the screen Aeneas um, escaping Troy, and that ties in to the idea of I guess what Taylor Swift was talking about when she came up with the idea for the folklore album. We had a choice, and we went this way. We could have gone that way, um, <clears throat> and so that's the choice that Aeneas is faced with in book two. We also have the great Amer last great American dynasty. Um, which is a long storytelling song, but it's basically about who knows fate. If I hadn't have shown up and bought this house, who knows what would have happened. Um, so once again, this is stuff that students have just come to me with. Um, they know more about Tay Tay than I ever will. Um, we move on to this album, Midnight's 2022. Um, a song called Labyrinth that speaks for itself pretty much. She talks about her mind being like a labyrinth you know, all the intricacies and the windy, turny paths and things. Um, but then I'm falling in love. Oh, no, I'm falling in love again. And somebody pointed out, oh, yep, that's like Icarus because he falls. And so I thought, yeah, I'll take that. You're engaging with this sort of stuff, so that's fine. But I also like the self-effacement here. I'm falling in love again. And that's a, a thing, I guess, that a lot of people miss about Taylor is that she does have a little bit of a self-effacing sense of humour. Um, <clears throat> And then down here in the video for Karma, off of that same album, here she is dressed as Nemesis. So she's talking about how Karma is a god, Karma is a bitch, Karma is my boyfriend, personifying all of this stuff, potentially as Nemesis. Um, once again, in her kind of reputation era, um, trying to wreak vengeance on those who have wronged her. Um, this one was really fun. Anti-hero must be exhausting, always rooting for the anti-hero. Um, and apologies for my poor singing voice and shrill nasal tones. Um, somebody pointed out Achilles is an anti-hero because we kind of like him, but we kind of don't in a lot of what he does, particularly in book. Um, 22 with Hector is quite disgusting, and we don't like him. However, he is the model hero. He is the anti-hero. So this is another thing that Taylor Swift is bringing to the uh, attention of the younger generations, the fact that we we could be always rooting for the anti-hero. There's good and bad in these sorts of figures. Um, oh, yes, and finally, the album released in April this year, um, The Torture Parts Department. Um, she has a song called Cassandra, and she's obviously referencing the classical figure there, and she's talking about it's burn the bitch, they're shrieking, but when the truth, truth comes out, it's quiet. So that's just a dig at... I guess the media, the dig at pop culture vultures who are sort of speaking out against Taylor Swift. I'll get to that point again very, very soon. She's chosen this figure of Cassandra, the prophetess who was never listened to. So this is something that Taylor is feeling like um, quite obviously in her career. Um, so that was just a really brief outline into how 
she's utilising some of the classics. What I really wanted to focus on today, though, was how she links to the likes of Sappho. And so here we are. Here is just a wee opening screen which links Sappho's Girls Academy with Taylor and her squad. So the idea that you've got this kinship, um, female friendship going on, um, that's a really surface link between these two um, poets. And I will say poets because obviously Sappho was accompanied with instrumentation and certainly some of Taylor's lyrics do have a poetic air about them. We go to um, Anne Carson and her translation, uh, if not winter, Fragments of Sappho, and fragment one is Dear Aphrodite, Sappho is asking Deathless Aphrodite, I beg you not to break with hard pains my heart. Obviously, anybody knows that some of Taylor's over talks about heartbreak, but that's not all that she talks about, and that's something that really annoys me, that she cops a lot of flack for just singing about her exes and lost loves and all that sort of thing. You write about what you know, and if that's what she knows, then that's okay. But I don't think a lot of it is autobiographical anyway. Talk about that more soon. Once again, <clears throat> fragment one. Come to me now, loose me from hard care, and all my heart longs to accomplish, accomplish you, Aphrodite, be my ally. We flash forward to 2024. This a song called The Prophecy off the Tortured Poets Department. Taylor says, please, I've been on my knees. Change the prophecy. Who do I have to speak to about if they can redo the prophecy? Okay, so that love lawn kind of um, being overtaken by desire and those feelings associated with that. Um, Freeman has a book called Searching for Sappho, and in it he tells us that Sappho in Fragment 1 deliberately portrays herself as a woman with a crazy heart, consistently unlucky in love, rather like a character from a modern romantic comedy, or perhaps a multi squillionaire pop singer. So I really like what Freeman's doing there, making that link for us. Talking about Sappho could quite easily fit in with the modern era. Um, song called Ivy, which is off again, Folklore. It's a fire, it's a goddamn blaze. She says, you started it, you started it, it's a war, it's the goddamn fight of my life, and you started it, is what Taylor says. And there's also a lot of this kind of fire imagery in some of her other work. Didn't have time to put every single reference to fire in there. Fragment 38 from Sappho is just simply, you burn me. So there's a link right there. Um, we have this article by Quok in 2021. Loving Who Has Read, The Dichotomy of Love and Desire, according to Sappho and Taylor Swift. Quite a good read, but this person's obviously a really mega Swifty. Um, but I recommend you check it out just as a starting point. She says, in these two poems, both poets are announcing responsibility for their desire um, and talking about the pain that's caused and accusing somebody else of, you know, starting it. Um, so placing the burden on somebody else's shoulders. Um, I just thought both of them tied together really well. And again, that's classic Taylor imagery. Um, this one here I've included off Reputation 2017, just because I think it is one of Taylor Swift's best songs um, in terms of the way that it's kind of R&B leaning. Um, and it is quite a sensual, racy song compared with a lot of her other stuff. Um, so we get this idea that she's kind of moving into this other sensual, sexual kind of direction. It's called Dress, really simple. Carve my name into your bedpost. I don't want you like a best friend. I only brought this dress so you could take it off. I only brought this dress so you could take it off. Um, really good image and just, yeah, full of longing and desire and all that sort of stuff. We compare that with fragment 57 of Sappho. Country girls, what country girl seduces your wits wearing a country dress, not knowing how to pull the cloth down to her ankles? Um, so again, Sappho's treatment of that is kind of funny. Taylor's is, like I said, a bit more straight-laced and sensual. But Quok comes in again, and I won't read this whole thing out to you, but it's just that idea that um, there's allure and there's desire. And down the bottom there, like Swift, third line from the bottom, Sappho depicts desire as a hunger that will overcome any obstacle, be it fabric or faux pas to achieve satisfaction. And then I've just put up their re uh, reactions 
um, Swifty reactions to that song coming out. Dress is making the Twitterati jump out of their skin. And then this wee caption here. Dress, dress, dress at Nate Taylor's mother walk out of the room. So that gives you an indication as to how sort of um, on point it is with regards to its kind of sexual overtones. Something a little bit different than what we might expect from, you know, the crazy cat lady who can't keep boyfriends. Anyway. Lover. I forget the year that this was out. 2019, I think. Um, the title track, quite lovely. Um, kind of waltzy time. Um, she swears to be over dramatic and true and always leave a plate at the table for my lover. Fragment 88, Sappho. I shall love as long as there's breath. I say I've been a strong lover. Um, obviously, you're sort of getting the point here. There's references. I don't think Taylor Swift is necessarily having copies of Sappho with her when she writes these songs, but it's just the idea that both of these poets, both of these artists, are portraying love, you know, in a similar way. Um, it's full of everything. It's full of pain. It's full of longing. It's desire. And again, it's not just Taylor's got a broken heart. Um, speaking of sweet mother, I cannot work the loon I bloom. I'm broken with longing for a boy by slender Aphrodite. So once again, Aphrodite's fault that Sappho's feeling like this. And now it's Eros, the melter of limbs, stirs me, sweet, bitter, unmanageable creature. So love is this force making Sappho feel a certain way. Obviously, it's making Tay-Tay feel a certain way. Here is just um, a quick search of her exes. This showed up, and I'm not attempting to malign her at all because I'm saying, you know, write about what you know. Um, and she is high profile. She's in the spotlight. A lot of people are interested in this stuff. But she's well known for these dalliances. Um, and I just thought it kind of tied in. Sweet, bitter, unmanageable creature. And the Melter of Limbs has again stirred Swift. Um, speaking of, I'm not maligning her. I found it really interesting while I was preparing this uh, talk that Sappho too um, suffered a little bit of um, ill talk. A lot of people talked about her um, in ways which are not very complimentary. Um, we talk about Sappho, or Emily Wilson rather, in the article Lady of Lesbos, talks about Sappho being the first female author and, you know, amazing, the Tenth Muse, that sort of thing. But a lot of people want to focus on her sexuality um, rather than the poetry, which, you know, is okay, I guess. Um, I'm not a gender or sexuality expert um, in terms of this, so I'm not really going to focus on this. But it's just interesting that a lot of the ancient um, writings focus on that as well as the modern ones. Um, I like what Carson has to say in her introduction um, to her translation. Basically, Sappho may have written songs about women and if she did how about we just leave it there and focus on the poetry um kind of difficult to just leave it there in this era but um the point that carson's making is it's again it's about the poetry um down here wilson goes on to tell us that it wasn't so much the same sex stuff that people uh, look down upon sappho for it was just her licentiousness uh seneca thought she was a prostitute. We've got here Aristotle talking about how she's honoured even though she's a woman. And then um, Tatian, who was a later Christian writer, says, quote, um, she was a sex-crazed whore who sings of her own wantonness, which I thought, think is a bit uncharitable. Um, so basically, Sappho is getting a lot of critical slack. Obviously, Taylor Swift is doing the same. She's suffering the same uh, slings and arrows, so to speak. Uh, David Robinson has an article about this very thing. And there's the title of it up the top there. The key quote for me is down the bottom. Some of the knee-jerk responses to Swiss music might say more about our culture of misogyny than her talent. Um, and that was just a quick survey of people talking out against her. The one that Nick Adams says is preposterous. Travis Kelsey wins $70,000, you know, playing on the winning team. Now you see why Taylor Swift is with, with him. It makes no sense whatsoever. Um I can't believe, actually, this is a thing, too. It's shameful and sad that a hyper-promiscuous, childless woman aging and alone has become a heroine. I mean, yeah, misogyny. It's just rife and it's all around us. Um, we've also got here <clears throat> Hallett talking about Sappho and her social context. 
feels that a lot of uh, men's imitation or praise of Sappho could actually swing from a desire to want to control feminine desire, take over the woman's voice, which I thought was interesting. And it's probably a lot more on that than we have time to cover here. And then Taylor down the bottom um, in an article for Time, I think it was, is talking about her songwriting gets trivialized while the media um, sort of paint her in this particular light, um, which again, terrible, but yeah, she's doing her best to sort of curtail that. And then just as we bring the Sappho part of this to a close here, um, she has a long lasting presence in the Western imagination um, because a lot of her poetry too is woman centered. Um, and obviously we don't have much of that. Uh, we don't have much of um, Sappho's fragments at all, but the fact that she's woman centered is quite key. And then down here, Robinson wonders if when um, two millennia from now, we're looking at Taylor Swift, we forget about all of the stuff and look at, oh my goodness, two minute warning. I'm gonna run through this as quick as we can. Um, Taylor Swift, <clears throat> personal life, and we just left the poetry. That will be quite intriguing to see. Um, now we move swiftly on to Catullus, a few hundred years down the track, the Roman poet, of course writing in about the, oh, what would it be, 50s BC, just at the Republic, I hate and I love. If you ask me to explain the contradiction, I can't. The pain is crucifixion, he says. In Catullus 85, we'll come back to that very soon, um, a lot of Catullus's stuff involves the effects of love, progression of affair, um, and the poet's persona, because I don't believe necessarily that it is Catullus the man. I think it's Catullus the poet, just like it's Swift the poet as opposed to Swift, the woman. Um, Catullus deals with um, not just the happiness of love, but also the side effects, if you like. Um, Kobentonsky has got this really great article about how um, Latin um, can be brought to life with pop music, and she uses Swift as, a, as an example here. She's talking about this thing that I'm talking about too. Um, it's construction, it's a persona, um, and it's something that students can sort of cling on to you know, being aware that this is a construction here. Taylor Swift down the bottom, um, a girl who's a serial dater, she's needy, she gets jilted, she writes a song about it all. The media are constructing this persona for her. Um, we bit rude here, I apologise. Catullus too was being accused of all sorts of things. So he came back with his um, poem number 16 and he's basically like, my poetry isn't this bad, everybody, so just STFU. And there it is. You can read it for yourself. This is his version of Shake It Off, I guess, because there's Taylor saying that the haters are going to hate and the players are going to play. I'm just going to shake it off really, really quickly. Blank Space, classic song, easily her best in her catalogue, is the most Catullan thing that I can think of when I think Taylor Swift. Um, I used to say that Catullus is like the Roman Taylor Swift in that he goes from zero to 100 really, really fast. Um and this song is a really good example of that. Nice to meet you where you've been. I can show you incredible things. Magic Madness, Heaven, Sin. Love's a game. Do you want to play? So it all starts out kind of seductive, kind of rosy, that sort of thing. We wonder if it's going to be forever or if it's going to go down in flames. Later on, Screaming, Crying, Perfect Storm. Oh, my God, who's she? I get drunk on jealousy. And then one of her best lines, Darling, I'm a nightmare, dressed like a daydream. And there's just selected screenshots. The lovers are in love. They're carving their name in a tree. We were on a nice picnic down the bottom. But then it goes to smashing his car up with a golf club and Taylor with the mascara running down her face, obviously in a fit of rage. Um, I hate and I love once again, number 85. The original tortured poet, perhaps Catullus. And all of this is just saying his conflict that he has in number 85 changes. So he goes from passionate and loving, wounded, and then he gets really snarky and snooty and quite rude, calling Lesbia, his love, a prostitute and suggesting she does all sorts of things around town with any number of men. Um, what's the point of all this? You people are probably wondering, why on earth have we bothered to sit through somebody over in New Zealand talk about these links? Well, I'll tell you why. Um, this is from when we organised a panel, Ancient World Modern Music 2, for... The Classical Association meeting of the Midwest and South, which was held this year, I attended remotely. 
music is an essential part of contemporary pop culture. Um, if we can look at what's going on in people's headphones, it's going to be a valuable resource for making classics more engaging and accessible. And that's really the key driver here, uh, particularly with Sasa, but also, I guess, in our own practice, trying to make this stuff more accessible to everybody. Um, and so this, to me, is the crux of it. Um, this is what was suggested about my paper uh, about hip hop and the classics. So a lot of it, a lot of what you've heard here today is student driven. It's just come up in conversation um, because that's the kind of environment that I guess we all want to have where we can actually commune with these students and talk about them and talk about their interests. So we're talking about they have agency in what they're learning and what they're listening to. Um, and they come back and tell us and they make these links. So it can, can be quote, incorporated into the classroom and also pedagogical activities can encourage students to participate in generating knowledge and insights. They can use their passion for music um, as a foundation to construct their knowledge of antiquity, go off and research and they themselves find something new and exciting. And I just think this behemoth that is Taylor Swift is a really good avenue to do that um, for the reasons I've talked about here. I probably need to calm down. If anybody has any questions and they want to email me and get any um, bibliography or whatever, feel free to find me at this address. Thank you very much for your time. Ka kite anō, and all the very best, everybody. Thank you so much, John. That was a lot of fun. So uh, I, I noticed that you have quite a quite a long list there of uh criticisms of taylor swift and are ready with the sort of the defense for them and i wondered in your comparison with sappho if you if you had any thoughts about the the necessity that being such a public female figure it that it has for that defensiveness that preemptive defensiveness you know, mm. We talked very briefly about the misogyny there, but I wonder if you can get into it a little. Um, so you're talking about in terms of how they're being defensive, the, the poets? Um, it... Just in terms of like, the like you know, both Sappho and Taylor Swift have this sort of pop icon mm -hmm. status, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this is actually when I teach Sappho frequently how I talk about her as sort of a, a a pop star mm -hmm. um her her music is the popular music right um and so like you mentioned a number of attacks on sappho mm -hmm. and it displayed a number of those attacks on taylor swift as well mm -hmm. and i wonder if you you could sort of elaborate on the the way that that is so different from how their male co-stars get treated <clears throat> it's just symptomatic, I guess, of society and how much we haven't changed. Um, <laughs> because that's the basic, the most basic explanation sort of I can give. And it was really depressing, actually, to sort of read that both of them are under this sort of duress. And also, I, I might have said it in the talk, how easy it was to just Google Taylor Swift criticisms Twitter and you get all of these pages. Um, and I, I'll go back to that Robinson article. I think it's just our attitude, um, this misogynist idea. I mean, I'm, I'm not necessarily um, that au fait with the idea of misogyny in ancient Greek times. You know, it wasn't even a term or whatever, but obviously Sappho is being derided for just being bawdy and licentious and disgusting. Um, but then you also have all this graffiti everywhere. You have, you know, in Pompeii, phalluses and things like that and that's okay you know but Sappho to talk about this sort of thing in the manner it's not um so yeah really good question um and I can't do much elaborating it just <laughs> it just shocks me it, and it saddens me um that we're still in that space you know um and and one, I, thing, I like what... one thing that struck me about it is that we have we have the worst criticisms of Sappho coming hundreds of years later mm. after after the culture has become uh you know very different about i mean like we like you said tertullius is is a christian mm. um so so do you think that time and distance 
will change how we view Taylor as well. I mean, if Sappho is anything to go by, maybe not. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think the further we go on, you strip away that kind of um, the artifice about her life and how she's living it. And if you just are left with the music and the poetry, um, then I think she's going to... Um, you know, get what she deserves um, in terms of the, you know, credit for stuff. You know, at the moment, I mean, she she does fascinate me um, insofar as I don't actually understand why she's so big. Um, I mean, there's certain poet, there's really obvious poetic elements in her writing and stuff, but the fact that she's just whipped every everybody up into this sort of frenzy, I don't understand that. Um and I guess you can sort of point to the fact if you're being cynical, okay, well, her father is in marketing for a start, potentially. But then again, you know, there was a slide in there which talked about how she was a discussion point in the Taiwanese election. And that would, you know, how, how the heck does that actually happen? Um, so I don't know if that artifice, that edifice is going to be stripped away because that's so kind of intertwined with her personality. Um, but I'd like to think that she does get her proper due 2000 years down the track um and hopefully we've evolved as a society um yeah who knows um yeah. there's one more thing that you you touched on a couple of different ways <clears throat> that i i wonder if we can just round this discussion off with which is intentionality <clears throat> um so you mentioned that that certainly taylor has a background in the basics of classics uh, you know she took latin she she had a presumably pretty darn good education overall mm -hmm. given how much money her family has um and that tends to correspond uh unfortunately with with mm -hmm. higher interest in the classics uh we would like to see that broaden obviously yeah. but you know at the same time, we have a lot of those themes that where you were comparing her to Sappho, like the, <laughs> the fires of love and all of that, that also seem very sort of general and 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 more yeah. of a like a thematic resonance than an illusion. Yeah. So how intentional do you think Taylor Swift is about incorporating classical elements into her poetry? Classical elements, I'm not too sure. Um, I certainly know that she is trying to copy Fitzgerald, F. Scott Fitzgerald. She's obsessed with The Great Gatsby, and basically she has a song on each album which kind of um, references that. Um, classically speaking, it's, it is a really interesting question, and I'm obsessed with it because I don't know if it can be quantified, um, and I like what you said there, that it's more resonances than illusions, and I think that's what we're dealing with here, the fact that this... Um, kind of stuff the this kind of po poeticism um the stories that have been handed down to us it's just something that permeates us you know as people you know we are interested in these stories we all know achilles um we can all sort of um make references to that sort of stuff um I, I, she might have read sappho very probably you know when she's sitting there writing her um songs as a 15 16 year old i'm sure Sappho would have been on her radar in terms of intentional sort of reference. I'm on the fence. I would probably lean towards not necessarily, um, but I still think it's more to do with that resonance. You know, it's not like um, I said in the hip hop um, version of what I um, presented for the disc odyssey, Jay-Z, for instance, his work, a lot of it references, believe it or not, um, Socrates and Plato, and he has read that sort of stuff. He said this in interviews, um, and it's a big concern of his. He's sat and read. He's come out and said this. Maybe we can get a hotline to Taylor and ask her. Um, but who knows? I, I don't think it's intentional. I just think it's kind of um part of this resonance that the classical world has and i guess this is what we're trying to do isn't it trying to point out to people um that hey these people you're listening to know this stuff you know they know of this stuff and then encouraging students and learners to just make these links well thank you so much that was such an interesting presentation i would have loved to take your class honestly it sounds yeah. so cool um I, my personal uh pop 
classical illusion obsession is Bastille. Um, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so I'm right there with you. Yeah, um, so thank you so very much. Lovely to have you on. Thank you very much, Julie. And you take care and all the best. You as well. And thank you so much to our audience and chat for participating. We are now going to move on.